Hi, everybody. We're going to get started now, and I want to welcome you to Improving Institutional Governance, How to Keep Your Institution Off the 5 O'Clock News. My name is Drum McNaughton, and I'm the CEO of The Change Leader, a management consultancy which improves higher education institutions. This is our monthly webinar series in which we bring you higher education experts who can help you create a vibrant, growth-oriented, financially sustainable institution without sacrificing its history, goals, and values. Our guest today is Lauren Bloom. Lauren's a forward-thinking senior general counsel and operations executive with 25 years of achievement in legal and strategic oversight positions at a number of government and private organizations. In addition to being a governance expert, Lauren's a skilled legislative and corporate advocate with significant experience representing organizational interests to state and federal lawmakers, and a rich history of success directing regulatory compliance, managing key relationships, negotiating favorable contracts, and increasing efficiency through innovative risk management, HR optimization, and internal policy initiatives. Lauren also writes business on business ethics for the street.com, the premier online destination for all areas where money and life intersect, and has authored three books including Elegant Ethical Solutions, A Practical Guide to Resolving Dilemmas While Preserving Your Business Relationships, and the award-winning book, The Art of the Apology, How, When, and Why to Give and Accept Apologies. Lauren's a graduate of Yale University, Catholic University's Columbus School of Law, where she was a valedictorian, and Georgetown University Law Center. On a personal note, Lauren and I have sat on boards now for 10 to 15 years, and I've found no one more knowledgeable at governance and creating effective boards of trustees and directors. Lauren, it's a real pleasure to have you on the broadcast today. Oh, thank you, Drum. It's a real pleasure to be here, and I appreciate the warm introduction. Um, Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for taking, or a good morning as the case may be. Take you, thank you for taking an hour out of your busy day to talk with me today about how to improve institutional governance and along the line, how to keep your institution off the 5 o'clock news. Now let's begin this. We're going to do a series of polls through the presentation so that we can interact a little more and I can get a better sense of what you're looking for in this presentation. So let's start with a real simple question. Why are you here today? Um, the poll is coming up, and as you'll see, there are several options, so please select the one that best explains why you chose to do this presentation today. And if you just click on the button next to the, to the sentence, it will, it will let you choose. Okay. We'll give the poll just a couple more minutes. Or, I'm sorry, a couple more seconds. Ah, very good. So, looks like the results are in, and some folks have got some specific governance concerns. Oh, Lauren, I think you'll be able to take care of those very easily. I certainly hope so. Well, I sincerely hope so, and I, I really hope that those of you who are participating will feel very free to, to send questions um, through the chat sy system. Um, we're happy to incorporate those into the presentation. Um, since we don't have a real set time today, I'm very happy to just be available to you throughout the presentation, so don't feel that you have to hold your questions till the end. So with that, um, let's just take a look at some fairly recent academic scandals that have made the national news in the last couple of years. Um, student cheating, a uh, classic problem. Actually, we've, we've chosen UNC and Harvard here as two that really were very widely publicized. But student cheating is a constant problem, and it shows up at universities around the country. Um, unfortunately, sometimes it doesn't get dealt with until it becomes enough of a, a crisis to attract the interest of the national media. Um, research scandals. Um, the Iowa State University, with a researcher who fabricated data in an AIDS um, research, claiming to have found a vaccine when, in fact, he hadn't. Um, psychological experiments gone terribly wrong at the University of Minnesota. Um, again, things that ended up becoming national scandals and that took, in the case of UMN particularly, many, many years before the university finally took an active step to deal with the problem. 
Um, sexual harassment. Who hasn't heard about the problems at Penn State? Um, and particularly in, in the, the sporting area, the Jerry Sandusky scandal, I think will we'll dog Penn State for a long time. UC Berkeley, and frankly, other universities as well. Um, the Vice President of the United States wouldn't be on a mission to stop sexual assault on college campuses if it wasn't a widespread problem. Um, IT systems hacks. Now, this can happen to anyone, um, an individual, a business. It's even happened to the federal government. But, you know, Rutgers and UCF both had, had major hacking problems um, where their systems went down, social security numbers, and other private data was stolen. Um, and then financial issues. Community and to some degree in business as well is struggling with the aftermath of the 2008 financial meltdown. Um, things at both Howard and Sweetbriar, um, both of them iconic universities in their own is a private university for young women that had a wonderful endowment that unfortunately was so badly tied up that the trustees couldn't spend it. Both of those colleges ended up on the, on, you know, the brink of, of closing their doors forever. And the question then becomes, through all of these crises, Recognizing that these things can be expensive and embarrassing. Um, ISU, for instance, lost almost one and a half million dollars in grants over the AIDS research scandal. Um, the University of Minnesota's handling of its problems ended up with its ethicists writing an open article criticizing the university administration for how they chose to handle the problems that they had. Um, the inaction at Rutgers was, was an awful embarrassment. Um, so and all of these things are situations where the boards of trustees appeared not to have taken an active and energetic role in monitoring and managing the problem. Now, let me say from the beginning that governance is one of those issues that really applies at every level in an institution. So you can talk about administration governance, you can talk about faculty governance, you can talk about student governance. But at the same time today, I think we're going to talk about the role of the Board of Trustees because that's an area where I see things changing. And I'm not sure that schools are keeping up with the changes. So the question becomes, in these situations and others like them, where is the Board of Trustees before the event becomes a crisis? So let's move to the next slide. Now, I think it's important at this point to take a step away from the academic world and look at things that have happened in the business world. Um, financial crises have changed forever the face of corporate governance in the United States for publicly traded corporations. Now, I need to say before we go any further that the results of the most recent presidential election have called these laws very much into doubt because there's been a shift in policy in Washington, and I don't know what that's going to mean long term. But first, we had Enron which gave us Sarbanes-Oxley, which put into place all kinds of monitoring and reporting requirements for, for publicly traded corporations. The 2008 meltdown, Dodd-Frank, focused primarily on financial institutions, but again, raised the bar for management of finance and oversight and reporting. Both of those statutes required changes in the way boards operate. And while, as I say, I think the, the future going forward is somewhat in flux given the, the most recent election, this has become part of corporate culture and I think something that shareholders expect, which means that while boards of these corporations still manage the finances in order to satisfy shareholders and indeed can face shareholder derivative suits if they don't, corporate boards are not just focusing on the financial statements anymore. They are much more activist down the line. Uh, they set direction and tone. They determine corporate mission. They do long-range risk management. Um, they direct high-level strategy. Um, there's a, the publicly traded company where the president of the company makes all the decisions is a thing of the past. And they practice good governance. And indeed, they are required by law to practice good governance. But there's a whole industry that has grown up around governance in the context of publicly traded businesses. And if we can move to the next slide, that cottage, ind that industry has found its way into other venues. So private corporations and nonprofits, including universities, have followed suit. Now, I want to emphasize that the laws I cited previously don't apply on their face to nonprofits, including universities, but 
questions of governance, questions of responsibility, how organizations and institutions are going to conduct themselves have become part of culture. There's a demand for greater accountability, greater transparency. I think one of the things that's almost certain to come out of the most recent election is a shift in focus on taxes and the tax-exempt status of some organizations and whether they get to keep it if they're not run properly. So what that means is that there's a tremendous shift in what boards are now required to do to engage in good governance. They still fundraise. And that is very much um, part of what boards must do to keep nonprofits and universities financially stable. Um, they still reach out to the community um, and serve as representatives. In the case of universities, reach out to alumni. But these days, nonprofit boards are also, like the corporate boards, actively, and I should state, by the way, that nonprofits are typically corporations. So what I'm talking about here is really the difference between commercial for-profit corporations that are publicly traded and nonprofit corporations. But they also actively participate in policy setting institution-wide, long-range strategic planning, uh, making sure that, that the policies that are set make sense for the future of the institution, governance, always, at every level, and risk assessment and management. So the question is, where are university boards stacking up collectively when you start dealing with these issues? Let me say that institutionally, when you've seen one board, you have seen one board, which is to say that every board of directors is unique just as every institution is unique. And it means that different boards have different roles. Um, so some of them will simply do fundraising. And that's true in a lot of non-academic charities as well. Um, the, the boards of most major charities are primarily fundraising boards. But other boards are more active. And I think these days, particularly as questions about how um, charitable contributions, endowments, um, public funds are spent, become more strident. You're going to see a greater insistence that boards step up and do more. So let's move to the next slide. Boards of directors have a lot of constituencies. And this is not necessarily obvious to boards that function in a particular manner. I think most trustees would say that they certainly have an important role to play in outreach to donors, um, which includes alumni, and to the community. Um, so that someone who's, who's on the board and is known to be on the board is an obvious person to do outreach in town gown relations. But that's only a segment of the constituencies that a university and therefore a board will have. There's also the faculty, um, both tenured and not, depending on the nature of the, of, of the organization, and both full-time and not. The administration, not just the president, but all of the people who work with him or her. The students, um, as we have seen, students are increasingly activists these days, and I think they're going to be even more so in the next few years. And it being 2016, every last one of them has a cell phone with a camera, which means they're all of them essentially amateur journalists on the ground. They are active, they are engaged, they are outspoken, and they're not someone that a board of directors can ignore. Ditto the parents. We'll talk about this more as we go forward. But these days, parents are, are wanting to be sure that their education dollars are best spent to prepare their children for a very uncertain future. And they also want to make sure that their children are safe on campus. Um, they want to make sure that their children are being well educated. And that if they're, they are minority or otherwise differently abled or subject to harassment of any kind, that the university will take appropriate steps to protect them. All of these groups, and I'm sure there are many others, are constituents of the university and therefore of the board. And so it behooves the board to be available to and aware of their interest. And that is why, if we move to the next slide, the old-fashioned model where the administration handles all those other groups, with the possible exception maybe of alumni a little bit, and simply reports back to the board of trustees is no longer workable. We'll handle it, just doesn't hack it anymore. Partially because when an institution any institution, whether it's a bank or a business or a charity or a university, is judged in public opinion. It is not judged by insiders who understand and appreciate the challenges. It's judged by people who don't, who expect perfection, realistically or not, and who become very strident 
when those expectations aren't met. Further, it becomes important for the board to recognize that the question of who supervises the administration is more important than ever because as we have seen again and again in these scandals, administrations often fall short for a whole string of reasons. And the difficulty is that if a board waits until it's time to fire the president, the damage is already done. Next slide, please. Now, I want to emphasize that when you are dealing with a board and board administration relationships, it becomes important in any setting to strike an appropriate balance between engagement and micromanagement. Um, it, it can be very tempting for board members to focus on the small picture to the, to the detriment of the big picture. And it is not the job of the board to administer day-to-day -day operations at a university or anywhere else. Effective boards think big picture. They, act, they think and act strategically, not tactically, and they really don't get into the minutia of execution. But they don't rubber stamp either. Um, the board that sits back and watches carefully crafted presentations developed by the president and his or her staff is not an effective board. So ideally, you find a way where the board becomes engaged, actively involved, conscientious about its responsibilities, curious about what's happening, and above all else, positive. Because you don't want the board to become punitive. Now, we'll get into more this in greater detail. Next slide. This is, this is a little bit about how you make that happen. The board's responsibility is set di direction and policy broadly at the strategic level. This is not to say that you get down into the weeds, but it is to say, what is the mission of the university? How is it evolving over time? What are our values? How do our curriculum offerings and our management and our, our investments and our student selection reflect those values? How are we different from other universities? What is it that we at this university want to achieve? Recognizing that it becomes the administration's responsibility to implement the broad strategic directions and policies set by the board. An effective board is going to manage the university's financial and governance strengths, is going to be aware of the importance of finance, is going to be aware of the importance of governance, and again, without digging into the weeds, make sure that things are being handled appropriately, not only at the board level, but throughout the university. An effective board assesses risk. Now, this is something that's relatively new. Um, not only in university settings, but, but in business as well, which is the, the sort of art slash science of enterprise risk management. That's another area that is becoming much more active in the wake of first Sarbanes-Oxley and now more recently the 2008 financial meltdown. Um, institutions are invest Financial institutions are investing millions of dollars every year in enterprise risk management. I think universities have been slow to follow suit, but I think that's going to change, and I think there's a very important role for the board in making sure that that happens and that they serve as active participants. And of course, the effective board hires and holds the university president and, through the president, his or her staff, accountable for results that are consistent with the mission, the, vi the vision, and the strategic goals that the board sets. So ultimately, next slide, please. Boards should act as overseers, or if you like, as stewards. Um, I, I think the concept of stewardship is getting a little shopworn, so I try not to use the word too much. But their job is to look at the big picture at the university and say, what's working, what isn't, if it isn't, why isn't it, and what can we as the board do to help make sure that it does. Now, I cannot emphasize strongly enough that the work needs to be collegial. And we'll touch on this again a couple of times throughout the presentation. One of the unfortunate consequences of the rules that have gone into place in the for-profit corporate world is that there are board mem boards now, and certainly board members, who think that their job as a board member is to be obnoxious to question everything, to be very suspicious if not downright paranoid and very aggressive, to assume, in other words, that the CEO and the staff are lying. That never works, and it especially 
doesn't work well in the kind of culture that you want at a university. So even as boards strive to do better governance, it's important for them to recognize that the people who, who run universities, the people who teach at universities, and the people who attend universities are all intelligent, capable people who deserve to be treated with respect. Next slide, please. So then the question becomes, what are board duties? And what are the duties of a board member? Let's move to the next slide. It's important to recognize that board members have individual responsibilities. Each board member is going to be held personally responsible and legally liable for his or her own actions, errors, and omissions. Many board members aren't aware of this. And chronically, when dealing with boards in any institution, there will tend to be the board member or members who is absent more often than present, who even when present is somewhat disengaged, who doesn't prepare well, who doesn't participate, who seems to go along, who, who doesn't ask the right questions, even though he or she had expertise that would have suggested the need for it. Ultimately, when thing go, things go wrong, as an individual, a person who has taken on responsibility to be on a board may be held responsible if he or she falls short in their duties. Next slide, please. But it's not enough, as important as it is, for individuals to fulfill their duties well. There's a separate responsibility and a, a magic, if you will, that happens when individual board members come together collectively to think, to discuss, and to act. That's why it becomes important for individuals to participate in board meetings and conference calls because ultimately it's the collective process of reasoning together that yields the best results. And so the whole board together shares collective responsibility and again liability to broadly ensure that the university is fulfilling its mission, remaining in compliance with all applicable laws, and, and remains financially sound. So let's move to the next slide. Now, the reason board members have these obligations is that board members in any setting, including the university setting, are fiduciaries. This is a term that gets bandied around a lot in financial circles, but it's not limited to, to financial companies, um, to investment advisors, banks, and the like. Any board member is a fiduciary of the organization, which means that he or she holds a special position of trust within the organization. There's been a lot of conversation recently about fiduciary duties because there are new De Department of Justice regulations that have come out, or maybe it's Department of Labor, I'm sorry, about investment analysts and their fiduciary responsibilities to their, their customers. Um, the analysts didn't want those responsibilities, and I think most of their customers would have thought they already had them. Um, but a fiduciary is required to act with the highest good of the, the organization in mind, which is to say, again, being careful to a level that you might not be if you weren't serving on the board. This is a higher standard of care than the standard that's imposed on professional staff. So even though the president is responsible for the overall administration of the university, unless there's something in the president's contract about it, and I would be surprised if there were, the members of the board actually are held to a higher standard of care than the president, him or herself. And that goes for the rest of the professional staff as well. And please bear in mind, those responsibilities are collective and personal and cannot be delegated away. So it's not enough for the board simply to rely on the administration. The board has its own duties and those have to be taken seriously. Next slide, please. Now there are three elements of the fiduciary responsibilities of a board member and they're all critical and to some degree they're coextensive. Um, and we'll talk in, in greater depth about each three. First is the duty of care, second is the duty of loyalty, and third is the duty of obedience. Now it's important to say that how they manifest depends to some degree on the setting. So these obligations will manifest somewhat differently in the university setting that they would in a for-profit corporation, for example, but the duties are fundamentally the same. Next slide, please. The duty of care. This is the one that in some ways is the easiest to understand. And in, uh, you can say that if you fulfill your duty of care, 
the odds are pretty good that the duty of loyalty and the duty of obedience will more or less take care of themselves if you pay a little additional attention to them. The duty of care is critical. Treat the university's affairs with the same care as your own. That's huge. And it means that one cannot accept a seat on a board as a kind of empty honor, a, you know, a nice thing for the resume, or a hobby position because you're fond as an alumna or alumnus of the place where you went to college. This involves financial oversight, um, confirming compliance with applicable tax law, um, and other laws like Title IX. Making sure that you understand the university's mission rules and bylaws, um, operating and board policy, and not only those policies and rules, but how those emerge in day-to-day -day operations of the university. Rules on paper are important, but the course of conduct, which is to say how an entity, an institution, executes its rules and policies, shape them, define them, and is every bit as important for the board to understand and appreciate. Next Warren, slide, please. We, we, have a, yes. we have a quick question on this. Oh, sure. Uh, this common course of conduct, it, it seems like if we go back to the Penn State scandal, uh, they would have had some sort of policy on sexual harassment or abuse or whatever, but then they had this pattern of conduct. Is that what you're talking about with this common course exactly of conduct? That is exactly what I'm talking about. The only thing worse than not having policies is having policies and knowingly or repeatedly ignoring or violating them. I am sure, and in fact under Title IX, I would think Penn State would have had to have policies to protect students and others from sexual harassment on campus. Mm -hmm. I mean, and, and in, in the case of Sandusky, we're allegedly talking about sexual assault. So this is something that's really serious. But if the practice of the university in the case of a talented and winning coach, is to look the other way, then the policy is not what's on paper. Not really. The real policy is to allow the coach to get away with it because the coach keeps winning games. Mm -hmm. And that's why it becomes important. Thank, and that, thank you, that's a great question. And that's why it becomes important if we move to the next slide. When fulfilling the duty of care, Again, politely, but for the board members not to stay on the surface of discussions. It's important to at least once, and, and you'll, you should get them in board orientation. And I, I will tell you, I think one-time board orientation is a very dangerous thing. But at least once, read the governing documents of the university. Um, any charters, any bylaws, any, any operating procedures for the board for various major committees. Um, and learn the essential history. What has happened at the university? Not just what you hear from the current president, but dig a little. Find out as much as you can about what the history is, because what you will probably find is that there are cultural hotspots within the institution that people who've been there a while all know about and nobody wants to discuss. Those hotspots are potential pitfalls for governance and good practice going forward. It becomes essential to understand institutional culture. So for example, again, I. I, I don't want to just pick on Penn State, although that's kind of a pretty troubling example. But if the institutional culture is we're awfully proud of our sports programs, um, good. What are the implications of that? Um, I have found, as I've done some, some research into university governance overall, that Penn State is not unique in having a, a winning sports program that tolerated bullying, inappropriate behavior towards students, blatant sexism, um, things that I think a university wouldn't want and probably would agree isn't, isn't part of its stated policies. But if you don't know the institutional culture, you might not realize how stated policies are being violated. And with that, you have to probe the administration's assertions. University presidents are very capable people. They are proud. They are intelligent. They're good at what they do. And like proud, capable, intelligent, professional people everywhere probably don't always take kindly to being questioned. Nonetheless, it's the board's job to ask questions, politely, but to ask them. And to challenge unspoken assumptions, for example, the assumption that it's terribly important for our university to have a winning sports team. Is it really? How does that contribute to the mission? What does that do for our learning objectives? What does that tell the world about us? Let's say, for example, that we've decided we want to put in a major new STEM program. How will having 
for winning football or basketball or hockey team help us with that? Yes, it may raise it all alumni dollars, but is it really where we want to put our time and attention as well as our treasure? It also becomes important to keep abreast of relevant news. For example, um, the recently adopted gainful employment rules at, at public colleges, we will uh, at um, private for profit colleges. We'll talk about that again in a, a little later on in the presentation, but that's relatively new. We're going to talk about how those apply not only to for-profit colleges, because the board would want to know that those rules were being followed and how they're being followed and what the scores are and what's going on. But nonprofit boards, private universities, may also have an interest in them as well. If you learn, for example, that there are some schools that are, are vastly abusing students' GI bills, it's worth a question to the, board, to the president about how your university is handling that problem. The answer may be very simple. But if you don't keep abreast of the news, you can't ask the right questions. Next slide, please. What that also means is that for a board member to be effective, the board member has to come prepared and show up. Not just read the materials on the plane to the board meeting or, or the day before, but really delve into them get prepared to ask questions, and also to participate. This can be harder for some people than others. And so it's often a good idea to at least experiment with things like breaking into small group conversations, for example, holding an annual or semi-annual retreat for the board where you can talk privately offline, providing opportunities like conference calls and webinars where people can get together so that they can talk regularly about what the university needs. Now, again, it becomes important to balance that healthy skepticism with a level of positivity so that the administration doesn't feel attacked. You don't want to put your president on the defensive. And you want to question, not confront. So it's a balance. Similarly, it's not fair to just snipe at things that go wrong. Um, a good board member thinks problems through and offers solutions. And an excellent board member brings the skills and training that he or she has garnered in life to benefit the university. So for example, um, when Howard University was having financial difficulties, when Sweet Briar was to the edge of having to close down because of its financial problems, if people on that board had financial backgrounds, it would have been a really good idea to offer that their insights to help the administration before a problem became a crisis. What that also means is that from time to time, board members will get special assignments. Um, a lawyer who's on the board probably can be expected to be asked to work on bylaws, for instance, or operating procedures at some point. Um, if you've got an accountant on the board, you might very well be asked to meet with the audit team. If you are, you fulfill those special assignments enthusiastically and bring to them the same competence that you would bring to your work if you were being paid to do it. Um, I worked years ago in a setting where I, I encountered an actuary who was doing all kinds of actuarial work for a hospital and had no background in health law but, and health actuarial science, but he was doing it as a volunteer, so he didn't think it was a problem. It was. Um, so it means that if you are volunteering, you need to make sure you do so capably and that you don't take on assignments you're not qualified to do, but you can perhaps steer the university administration towards someone who can volunteer, whose capabilities harmonize with yours so that the work can get done well. Next slide. Duty of loyalty. I mentioned earlier, this comes down to the obligation to put the university's interests first. When you are serving as a trustee, it's the university's well-being that is paramount at all times. That means it's important for board members as individuals to practice personal integrity and transparency, to explain what they're doing, why they're doing it. Um, if they have a personal interest in something, it needs to be appropriately disclosed. And I will tell you, I think the common thinking around conflict of interest is evolving these days. So that simple disclosure and, oh yeah, Joe, that's fine, doesn't fly anymore. I think more and more these days, people are saying, you know, if you've got a conflict of interest, you really shouldn't do X. So it becomes important for individual board members to be very honest with themselves and with the board about their personal interests, um, their personal prejudices. You know, we all have them. 
And if you're blind to them, it's a good idea to have a culture that will quietly and kindly call you out on them. But it also becomes important if, for example, you really do believe that sports have no place at a university and that everything ought to be geared toward academics. Or if you really do believe that any university, whether for profit or not, should only be teaching students things that will allow them to get well-paying jobs when they graduate, it's important for people on the board to know that. Because then they can take your views into account when you're having discussions. It isn't to say that you're right or wrong. It's simply to say that they know where you're coming from. And it's important for the board collectively to do that as well. Now, having said that, board conversations can get pretty heated. And so it becomes important once a decision has been reached for the members of the board to support it, even if they think it's going to be necessary at some point to go back and ask for reconsideration. Because if you have a situation where a board agrees to something and gives the administration direction, and then individual board members are undercutting that board decision, at the very least, it's going to cause confusion. At worst, what it's going to do is send the message that the board isn't serious about it actions, which will give the administration an awful lot of discretion to do as it pleases, and that's not good institutionally. Next slide, please. So while we're moving to the next slide, um, let's talk about a little bit about the practicalities of what it means to exercise the duty of loyalty. Certainly, if you serve on a committee with a board, um, it becomes important for the committee's work to be appropriately balanced when the board takes an action. This can be hard. Um, if you've served on a committee and you're excited about what's happened there and you want to make sure that the committee's work is appreciated and taken into account, if the board ultimately decides to go in a different direction, that can be frustrating. But it becomes important for the board policy ultimately to take precedence. This goes back to what I said earlier. Argue strenuously, advocate for your position, and then once a board has made a decision, so be it. Very important to avoid inappropriate use of university opportunities for personal gain. Um, that means that you are not eligible except that you are on the board. Child or grandchild isn't granted auto automatic admission to the university just because you're on the board. It means that you're not necessarily using, board, uh, using university facilities for private events. Um, you don't take expensive vacations on the university's nickel. In other words, again, putting the interests of the university first, you don't allow your personal desires or your family's desires to take precedence over what's objectively good. And if you've got any question about what will play on that or not, imagine what you'd like to do on the 6 o'clock news and think about whether you'd really want that to happen. Personality conflicts. Um, they happen. They're inevitable. To a degree, they're a good thing. In over 30 years of practicing law, I can tell you that I've seen many boards and operations. And there is always someone, sometimes some ones, but always at least someone, who falls into the role of the loyal opposition. It can be annoying as all get out, but they're essential because these are the people who make boards stop and think. And so if there are personality conflicts, Yes, they exist. You can acknowledge them. You can be reluctant to work with someone, but you need to put them aside for the good of the association of, of, of the uh, institution. And confidentiality. Start from the premise that everything you learn around board membership is confidential and treat it accordingly. Do not disclose anything without permission. And I like to get it in writing so there's never any question later about what was said. Um, it's not that I want to play gotcha. It's that if I have a question about what I am and am and am not allowed to release, I can go back and look and tailor my actions accordingly. Next slide, please. The duty of compliance. This is the duty to ensure that the university is in compliance with all applicable federal, state, and local laws. Compliance with law is not discretionary. Yes, there's some grounds around how you interpret and how you apply. There you might have a little wiggle room, but, you must, but a university must comply. And the consequences of noncompliance can be huge. So this is a place where board members can rely thoughtfully 
on the legal advice that they receive from the administration. Now, notice that I do say thoughtfully. Um, you're not expected to be an attorney if you're not one, and if you're not counsel to the university, you're not expected to behave as though you were, but. Again, you can't simply sit there and nod while university counsel tells you something. If nothing else, because historically we have seen that university councils, who candidly ought to have known better in many of the scandals that, that we used at the top of the hour, either weren't listened to or didn't object to various practices at universities that ultimately created terrible problems. So it's OK to rely on the legal advice that the university is given, but never hesitate to ask questions. A good lawyer will welcome questions, because questions are an opportunity to explain and clarify. And if your university counsel doesn't welcome questions, then something needs to be done. Now, when it comes to bylaws, duly adopted policies, the obligation of compliance is not quite as strict. Um, it is possible to make minor deviations, immaterial deviations, if you like, from bylaws and duly adopted policies, especially when they can be adjusted. But I am talking about immaterial deviations. I'm not talking about a policy that says no sexual harassment on campus, but it's OK for our coach. So what that means is that the board has some obligation to ensure that the university is operating the way it says it's going to operate. Now, there are a couple of reasons for this. I mentioned earlier that there's the only thing worse than having a poli no policy is having a policy and not following it. And that's true, first of all, because it means that the policies become highly questionable. Um, people don't rely on them. People don't trust in them. The credibility of the institution comes into question. But also, whenever there are dis deviations from stated policies, lawmakers, trial attorneys, judges, and juries want to know why. And if there isn't a clear explanation for why there's a deviation, they will start to imagine them. And they tend to imagine things like discrimination, intentional, intentional misconduct. So for example, if there's a policy on, on um, equal opportunity at the university, and all of a sudden people of a certain gender, or race, or religion, or national origin aren't being admitted, it may be accidental, but that's not how it's going to look. And the first thing an attorney bringing a lawsuit against a university is going to want to know is why the policy wasn't followed. Next slide, please. So what does that mean? It means that as fiduciaries, board members act as guardians of the university's mission. This goes back to what I was asking earlier. What is the university there to do? Why does it exist? And it's been there 100 and some years. It's not a mission. That's just a statement of historical fact. So what is it there to do? Are the goals supporting the mission? Are the learning objectives supporting the mission? Is the university planning and executing in a way that's consistent with its reason for being? Then the board is responsible for overseeing the university's compliance with good governance at every level, not only in the board, although it's really critical there, but also within the administration. How are decisions made there? How do people communicate with each other? Are there regular meetings? What opportunities are there for differences of opinion to, be, to surface and be discussed? Uh, faculty governance. Who gets tenure if they do and why? How are those decisions made? If they don't get tenure, who are, how are the non-tenured professors, who may be up to 70% or even more of the faculty, being given a voice in decisions that affect the faculty? What's happening with curriculum selection? Who is doing research? Who is paying for it? And who's got controls in place to make sure it's being done responsibly? Student organizations. Who are they? How do we decide which students organize, which organizations are allowed on campus and which aren't? What the honor code actually looks like how it's enforced, you get the idea. And also, it becomes important for the board to support the administration in making principal decisions that may or may not be unpopular. So for example, if the decision is made to fire the bullying coach, that bullying coach may be winning every season and bringing in a lot of alumni money. So it's not necessarily going to be a popular decision to fire the bully. But if you've got an anti-bullying policy on campus, and I certainly hope that you do, the principal decision is to discipline the coach. And the board ought to support that decision, not undercut it. 
Next slide, please. So in some, it's important for board members to familiarize themselves with the history and mission and, pol and policies of the, organi of the institution. It's important for them to be active and engaged and prepared for board interactions. To broadly manage the university's finances, make sure that fundraising is done responsibly, make sure appropriate financial controls are in place. This is another place where it's perfectly acceptable to rely thoughtfully on the university's auditors. But again, rely thoughtfully, ask questions. If the auditors aren't meeting with the board, maybe they should. If there isn't an active audit committee engaging regularly with the auditors, maybe there should be. And also take a serious look at risk management. I mentioned that enterprise risk management is becoming a major initiative, both in um, cor corporate or entities, but also in nonprofits that are not universities. It's got a place, I think, in university culture as well. You know, looking forward and saying, how is the world changing? What are the risks facing us? What are our strengths? What are our weaknesses? How can we accommodate foreseeable risks and manage them? We can't say we'll never take another risk, because if you don't take risk, don't succeed. But what are the risks we can identify, and what plans do we have in place to manage those risks to a level that we find acceptable? Next slide, please. Again, think strategically and not tactically. Make sure that you're not getting down in the weeds. I used to know one church board of directors that would spend maybe 10 minutes passing the church's annual budget, which was well in excess of a couple million dollars. Pass it in 10 minutes, no real questions, thank you. And then they'd argue for 20 minutes about what color to paint the nursery. You don't want to do that. Um, think about the mission, the vision, the academic initiatives, the programs that you have on campus, the guest speakers that you bring in, the corporate outreach that you might do to fund research or special programs, um, how you're helping students navigate the, the brave new world of today's economy. Um, attend to good governance. Make sure the transparency and accountability become part of the university's culture at every level. Make sure that real or potential conflicts of interest are disclosed and appropriately dealt with. There are different ways to do that. This is a place where university council can be tremendously helpful. What's important is not to let them fester. Make sure that you bring proper respect to the administration, um, to the president, and the president's staff. And that to the extent there are potential conflicts within the administration, that the board, to the extent that it can, is able to, to step in and help manage the conflicts to the good of the institution. Bring best judgment to all board actions. Um, it's not OK to pay attention half or three quarters of the time. And finally, really re recommit regularly to their duties. Um, one of the places I find as well are very vulnerable is on tenure, um, where board members continue to stay on the board for an awfully long time. Um, if there aren't term limits, if there isn't healthy turnover, what can happen is that boards become set in their ways. They become accustomed to doing things as they've always been done. And that creates tremendous opportunity for embarrassments and scandals when culture changes and the universities don't change with it. So it becomes important for board members, whenever they stand for re-election or reappointment, and even when they're simply serving out their terms, to make sure that they're still excited about what they're doing. And if board service has become a reluctant duty rather than a pleasure, then maybe it's time to step down. Next slide, please. Effective boards fulfill the fiduciary responsibilities that we discussed, individually and collectively. A good board is an exciting place to be. They strike an appropriate balance between being candid and truthful and even a little bit challenging with one another, while being exquisitely polite. So it's difficult conversations without having them become confrontations. They ask great questions without micromanaging which of course requires all the press. It can all of the constituencies of the university, not, not just the immediate community. And they help the administration succeed, um, to do the right thing, to make the tough decisions, to, to set priorities, to operate in a way that brings institution. 
And finally, they think strategically for a sustainable future. And this can take a little bit of vision. Um, the world has changed enormously over the last 10 years, to the point now where it was once almost essential that people be physically on site to participate in an education. Now people can enroll from all over the world. What is that going to mean for your institution? How are things going to change? These days they're predicting that students who graduate will have seven or eight career lifetimes. How are universities going to fit into that? What does that look like? And so these are the kinds of things that is going to be important for board members to, to do. Now, every board has its challenges. Even the best boards will have problems. Next slide, please. And so what that means is there will be the personality conflicts, the ineffective board members, um, disengaged board members, um, board chair, bad relationships between the board and the administration. There may be unproductive board talk, but nothing. Um, the people who run the university may be real good at what they do, but not necessarily the best at training the faculty, the donors, the students, and there is the board caught in the middle. Now, the good news is that the change leader is here to help. Um, I have, as Drum mentioned, I have known him for many years. I know him to be a very capable person who is working with a tremendous pool of talented individuals who are available to help individual boards solve the specific governance problems that can keep them from achieving their best outcomes. So, Lauren, Lauren we've, had yes. a, we've had a question along from that okay. previous slide. Um, talk about, if you would, a little bit of the role of the nominating committee for bringing on new board members and how it can help overcome the challenges that you mentioned on this slide. Oh, the nominating committee can be an absolute godsend when it comes to avoiding these kinds of problems. Um, personally, I, I think it depends to some degree on the structure of the institution. Um, but volunteer committees are a great place to vet new board members. I tend to be very reluctant to airdrop board members into the board without an awful lot of certainty that they've got the skills that you need and also the ability to serve well. People who are are good lawyers, good accountants, good fundraisers, good publicists, what have you, aren't necessarily good at board engagement. And so if you can observe them in the context of a committee or of a particular initiative, then, you know, like, like a fundraiser, for example, and see how they work, then you can get an idea about whether or not they belong on your board. Um, it's a good idea to interview board members. Self-nominations are nice, but the problem with self-nominations is that people will often, unfortunately, nominate themselves to boards, not so much because they want to do the work as because they want the perks. You know, either it's going to look good on a resume or they see it as a stepping stone to, to more respect in the community or a better job or what have you. And so you want to make sure that the people who are volunteering really are, are people who will bring to the table what you need and aren't people who are simply there to get something. You want to, make, you want to really test them on their, their ability to commit the time and the attention. Um, these days, people tend to take on too much all the time. And of course, people who are known to be good are invariably overcommitted because everybody wants a piece of them. But sometimes it's better to say, maybe not now. Um, I think it's useful for nominating committees to know people over a period of time and maybe not nominate them the instant that they come up. Um, I think also nominating committees need to have criteria for what they're looking for. Um, because year to year it will change depending on the balance of the board and if there are rotations. So one year you may really need a lot of people with financial expertise. Another year you may really need people whose thing is, is public relations. And so it's a good idea for nominating committees to get together in advance and put those criteria together. I hope that answers the question. Yeah, I, I think it does. Uh, one of the things, just piggybacking on that, is the amount of time that people are putting in on boards has increased significantly over the last few years. And I've seen some stats from the National Association of Corporate Directors that the average board service requires upward to 200 days per year per board. 
and we're seeing people sitting on five and six boards, mathematically it's just not possible for them to be an attentive good board member on every board they sit. No, it isn't. And that's the point where it becomes the responsibility of the board member to say, you know, I can't do this. Mm -hmm. um, I stepped down from a board myself at one point because I knew I couldn't put in the time. And, and that number that you, you cited, those 200 hours, Drew, Drum, really come back to what we were saying about the obligations of board members. People have to do a lot more these days than they used to. And if they're not serving well, they shouldn't serve. Now, that means it's a challenge sometimes to recruit people. And so you want to look at your board structure and say, all right, maybe we'll do most of our work with committees and only have a very small board. But depending on how things are structured, the last thing you want to do is bring someone onto the board who's, go who's likely to be a problem. If you're not sure, wait. Sage advice. So. Any other questions? No, I think that covers all of them. So, well, there is, I take it back. We just got one more in. It says, okay. what are you seeing in the differences between for-profit and not-for-profit education governance models? Um, I think, it's like I said earlier, when you see one, one organization, you've seen one organization. Um, I will say that I think for-profits face different challenges, in part because of the gainful employment rules. Um, those are requiring for-profits to really knuckle down in terms of record keeping and reporting, which means that their governance structure has to reflect that. And so there's, there is, and I think will need to be even more emphasis on making sure that the, the for-profit schools are offering real value, and not only real value, but to a population that can afford to, to have that value. You know, the gainful employment rules got going because unfortunately there were some, some abuses in the, the for-profit community of students who were already part of an economic underclass who couldn't necessarily afford school in the first place and then found they weren't employable when they got out. Um, so I think that's been something that has been, has forced the for-profit schools to look very carefully at their governance. Now, overall, it's probably a good thing. I think in the non-profit or private university setting, perhaps, in fact, no, I'm going to say perhaps, things have been too slow to adjust to the new realities. I think there's been a tendency to say, well, that wasn't us. And so it means that boards have tended not to move as quickly as they probably needed to to take a more activist role in the operations of universities. I think there's been a tendency to assume that what's been done has been fine and therefore we'll just continue doing it. I don't think there has necessarily been enough attention paid to the flip side of the gainful employment rules. Um, I, those don't apply, obviously, to not-for-profit and private universities, but except to the extent that they're doing certificate programs and the like. But I do think that parents are looking at their kids and saying, I'm spending you know, $100,000 plus on educating my kid, and he or she won't be able to get a decent paying job when they get out. Why am I doing this? I think that's going to mean that over time, while, while not sacrificing academic excellence, it's going to become important for colleges to say, what are we really here to do and what is it that we're really here to teach, recognizing that there are going to be students who simply go to college to become well-educated, well-rounded human beings. But the expectation that that's the only goal, I think, isn't going to, going to hold true for very long. Thank you. I think that really sums it up nicely. So, Lauren, thank you so much. It's always a pleasure hearing you speak and talking about this subject, which I know you're so passionate about. Absolutely. And Drum, thank you so much for the opportunity. I really appreciate the time. And thank you to our listeners for, to, for being here today. Thank you. Take care. Take care. Bye-bye.